All right, folks, welcome back to another episode of All About the Gear. I'm sitting here with my good buddy, Mr. Doug K, who got his hands on an interesting piece of hardware for us to discuss in this show, and that's the Sigma DP2 Quattro Compact Digital Camera. Doug K, you, uh, you, you took this thing around San Francisco. Did you, were, did, were you getting stares, or were people like, hey, man, what, what, what are you carrying around there? Yeah, it's true. I think, you know, people look at this camera. Let me show it to you here. And they say, what the heck is that? Uh, <laughs> I didn't get many, that? maybe as many stairs as I thought. But here's just the sort of top view of this thing. Look at the form factor. It's got this very long edge on the grip side, right? This is yeah. over here. This is the grip side. And I'll turn it on this way because that's how I actually hold it. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a strange looking camera. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But uh, this is the Sigma DP2 Quattro, which a lot of fanboys have been talking about. Yeah, I want to know. That's why I want to do this review. I want to hear what they're talking about. Because that's, that's a camera, obviously, I don't think I would ever purchase because, you know, I have other systems and I'm not in the Sigma crowd. Not, not because Sigma is not good or anything. It's just I'm, you know, I drive this car instead of that car. But uh, what, what are we looking at in, in terms of price point to get into this guy? Yeah, this, so this is a $1,000 camera, $999, right? Yeah. Uh, and it is, boy, where to start on this thing? Okay, so it's, the body's weird, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but the main thing that they're selling here is the sensor. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a company called Foveon who developed this sensor that uses a radically different technology from the other sensors we have in all of our other cameras. Mm -hmm. And they were acquired by Sigma in 2008. I remember that, yeah. And so Sigma then, you know, has been releasing a line of Foveon-based cameras ever since. Um, but they're off in their own world. I mean, they're making cameras, as you can see from this one, you know, that, that you know, just aren't like other cameras. So this camera has a fixed 30-millimeter lens. It's an APS-C size sensor, so that, that, that gives us an equivalent field of view of roughly... Uh, a 50 millimeter lens, so it's sort of a normal lens. It's an f2.8 lens, so it's fairly fast. Yeah. Um, and I mean, the highlights here are it takes, it's capable, let's say, of taking remarkably good pictures. Mm. And the post production, if you use raw files, is a disaster <laughs> in right. terms of what you have to go through. So now I can already see the mail coming in, even though I haven't said this yet, but I yeah. think we have to call this a cult camera. A cult camera. <laughs> That's right. Wow. Similar to what we used to say about the Leica thing, and you know, we got a lot, we got hate mail for that too from the Leica fanboys. Right, but right. But this, this is a camera that you've got to want to like. This is not a camera that is easy to love. Now, uh, see that is it? Is it a is it a like a, a proof of concept technology for the that X3 Foveon sensor? Kind of like the Lytro, the first Lytro is kind of like a proof of concept for the light field technology. Well, I, I would have thought that, you know, when I said that about the original Lytro, I said, oh, they're not really in the camera business. And I turned out to be 180 degrees wrong because right. now Lytro has come out with a new one that yeah. looks for all intents and purposes like a regular camera. Yeah. Here, uh, Sigma's doing something interesting. They're doing a, a, tr a test drive program where you can give them a credit card and they'll send you a camera for a week to, to test, to play with. Well, that's and cool. You can buy it or send it back or send it back and buy a brand new one, whatever you want. But I think they're relatively serious about the, getting this out as a real camera. The question is, for whom? Yeah, and that's what we're going to get to um, at, at the at the end of this because I want to know. I always ask that question. Like, I, who, 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 I, I, I want to make sure you didn't answer in the beginning so I didn't put it in the show notes. Yeah, it's like in marketing. <laughs> it's in, in marketing. They tell you to survey your audience first and right. then build your product so that you're sure that you're building what they want versus – just building a product and then trying to force fit it into the market. It seems like some of these camera companies are doing that. You know, there's like, oh, yeah, you know, let me build it like this and then put it out there and see if they like it. I don't know. But what about the menuing system in this? Now, look, looking at the ergonomics of it, I don't know if I could. I mean, you said it's comfortable in your hands, but how is, how is it in your hands and trying to find your way around the UI? Yeah, I mean, it's actually surprisingly good um the buttons on the camera are relatively sparse or spartan yeah. but once you get used to it everything you need is there uh powered up takes about a second and a half to come on uh and the menuing system is pretty traditional uh you can find what you need quite easily now 
the 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 LCD on this thing looks great at first, but I got to tell you, one of the problems of this thing is it, it is a disaster in daylight. Oh no! You cannot see this at all. And remember, there's no electronic viewfinder here, so taking a picture is like a point and shoot. You've got to use the rear LCD, and um, you can't see it in bright light. Just cannot see it. And I've got it cranked up all the way. So that's you know sort of a, a killer there, but. That's going to come back to the question of, you know, what do you use this for? And, you know, when are you out there maybe hand-holding in daylight and so forth? And yeah. We'll see. So I think let's talk a little bit about this sensor, and we can come back to some of the other details. Does that make sense here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I definitely want to talk about the ergonomics and the and the menuing system in yeah. there. All right. So. Well, let's, 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 you know, ergonomics, let's talk about that. Yeah. It, it does, you know, as I said, it's got the right menuing system in there. Let me turn mm -hmm. it back on here. Um, it comes with an external flash. Okay. Oh, that's nice. yeah. So it actually ships in the box with this flash. It sits in the hot shoe and it goes on sort of like this. You can sort of see that. All right. Yeah. Yep. Um, and although the grip is this is this weird wide thing, it feels pretty good in the hand. So it's not at all difficult to shoot with, and all the controls are pretty much there. Uh, Uncle Doug's um, uh, exposure triangle test. It gets a six out of twelve, which yeah, means. It's, it's, yeah, it's pretty easy for, for a simple camera. It's not hard to get to all the things you need to get to in order to adjust your exposure. Yeah, yeah, that's nice. And what about battery life of this thing? It looks it doesn't look like it could have, hold a pretty giant battery in there. Yeah, the battery is, you know, probably reasonably sized. Let me turn it off. The battery is, you know, reasonable size for a camera like this, but the battery life is pretty poor. What they do is that Sigma ships two batteries with the camera and an external charger. So... Wow. Uh, they they acknowledge right out of the shoot that this is not a camera with terrific battery life. Well, that's good. I mean, at least they acknowledge that, and they ship it with a solution to the short battery life. Yeah. So, yeah, that's cool. Well, kudos to them for that, because I know some camera companies don't do that. <laughs> you know, yeah. That, and, and, that, and, that ship cameras with bad battery life, Doug. You know what I'm talking uh, about? I do. I do. I do. <laughs> but, you know, I... I took both batteries with me. I never fully exhausted one, but then again, I didn't shoot a lot with it because to get a good picture, this is not a snapshot camera by any means. You know, your your images have to be more carefully planned to take advantage of it. Yeah. And then you realize you're coming back with what's going to take a long time in post. So you, you say, oh God, I better not shoot all these pictures because I'll have to deal with them later. Yeah. Now, Doug, one of the questions that I had was was regarding, you know, a lot of folks we talk about on the show are using bracketing for HDR and that, that sort of thing. With that Foveon sensor, that X3 sensor in there, it seems like you could, you know, make some pretty nice HDR shots with this. Does it does it support bracketing and all that good stuff? Yeah, it, uh, it supports basic bracketing. You can do three exposures, and you can go all the way down to minus three EV or plus three EV, which is, you know, plus or minus three stops. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's real handy for that. Although I think, as we'll talk about, the, the image quality for the right kind of shot is so good that it doesn't push you into HDR in too many situations. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I want to talk about that. Now, what about the, the, the resulted image? So it, the, I was, I'm assuming you're shooting in RAW, so it gives you a, a nice RAW file. How is it from the time that you click the shutter to the time that you can see it on the back of the camera? Uh, it's slow. Uh, there's, there's a lot of processing going on here. It's not a a rapid camera in terms of shooting, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, chimping, shooting, chimping, uh, you can shoot, but it's, you know, it's going to take you a second or two in between individual shots before you can shoot again, because there's a lot going on in the processor. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Again, maybe it's a proof of concept. Who knows? Um, but you said this is, this is like the successor to the Merrill, right? There was a, yeah. there was a Merrill version of this. So that was, which also had the Foveon sensor in it, correct? That's right. It had the previous Foveon sensor, uh, and there were three versions of the Merrill, still are, actually. You can still buy them. There's the DP-1, which is a 28-millimeter equivalent, the DP-2, which is like this. It has the 50 equivalent, and the DP-3, which has the you know semi-telephoto 75-millimeter equivalent. So you get three different fixed lenses on the three different Merrill bodies. Mm -hmm. Interesting. This so, one, they've only got the DP-2 out. I, I think they're going to announce a DP-1 and a DP-3, but who knows? Okay. Well, let's talk about the lens a little bit. So this is this is uh, what equivalent? It's a fixed lens, right? So what's yeah. the what's the focal length? Thirty millimeter f two eight. It's close to you know it's a forty five millimeter equivalent or so, given the size of the sensor on this thing. Uh, it is 
actually a beautiful lens in terms of how it's matched to the sensor and the camera. I mean, they work really well together. Um, so, I, you know, it's obviously optimized for image quality. That, that's what this camera is all about. Okay. All right. Well, then let's talk about that. It's optimized for image quality, which means it's matched to the sensor that's in here, So, which is that Foveon sensor. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I know you did some research and you dove in deep. What, for the folks that don't know, what, what are the differences, the main differences between this Foveon X3 technology versus what you're going to find in, say, your Sony A7 or a Panasonic GH, whatever? Yeah. Well, there are... There are many differences. I think the, the way to start looking at this is, first of all, consider a normal sensor in which all the pixels are on the same plane. And you have sort of two ways to do it. The vast majority of cameras use a Bayer pattern, which means that there are every four pixels, you have two greens, one red, one blue. Mm -hmm. And that pattern repeats itself over the sensor. So every pixel, every four pixels, is a cluster of these four colors, two of them green, and then one in the other two colors. Uh, Fuji, uh, with the X-Trans sensor, does it a little differently. It's still a single plane of pixels, but they um, distribute them differently so that you don't get the Mori effects that you might get with the Bayer sensor. Now, these guys at Sigma slash Foveon have a totally different approach. What they do is they take advantage of the fact that silicon is translucent, that light passes through silicon, and so they stack their pixels on top of one another. And so what happens, and, and the reason this works is that the, the different wavelengths of light focus at different depths, mm -hmm. which is actually a problem with traditional sensors, but here they take advantage of it. So the top layer is the blue sensor, uh, which is a um, a 20 megapixel sensor. Then below that is the green sensor, which actually has only one quarter as many pixels. The pixels are four times the size. So there's a five megapixel green sensor. And then below that is a five megapixel red sensor. Hmm. So the light is actually going through the different layers to, to make a complete exposure. Uh, totally, totally different. The advantages are they don't have to do what's called demosaicing. So if you think about the regular sensor where you've got each every you know every fourth pixel is a different color, um, they have to the camera has to figure out how to put those back so that you don't get these color jaggies. And in yeah. fact, you do get them sometimes. You get you know uh, a line that goes through and it diagonally goes through and it cuts through the red, it cuts through the green, it cuts through the blue. Here, um, all the pixels are aligned with one another. Interesting. So wow. to totally different technology. And then, so in your experience, looking at files off of this guy, first of all, what, what size files are you getting from this camera and putting them side by side with a more traditional sensor? Do you notice a real difference in quality? Yeah, this is, this is the most interesting thing about the camera. First of all, um, Sigma calls it a 39 megapixel camera. There's always this debate about how many megapixels is. The fact is that when you're all done and you process a file, they come out to just a little under 20 megapixels. Okay. I think they're they're counting their different layers as being separate pixels, which is mm. not quite fair. Um, but this is the odd thing about this. For the right subject matter and the right lighting conditions, this camera produces some absolutely phenomenal images. Now, I'm... Um, it's so much, I can't really show them here in the video for those who are listening or watching the video. But if you go to the TWIP website, you're going to be able to see these images. We're going to put them up in a way that, that renders fairly high resolution or we'll, we'll do them one-to-one. -one. And you can see a couple of things about this. First of all, again, for the right subject and lighting, you get incredible detail out of this camera, more so than I've seen in any other camera. Mm -hmm. And there's a, an odd thing, I can't explain it, but there's a, a depth to the images. There's a three-dimensionality to the images. And it, it seems to show up particularly on metallic objects or objects with a lot of inherent texture. Yeah. I'm sure there are people who have analyzed this to death and tried to understand it technically, and there are probably research papers. I haven't read those. I don't understand it. But again, for some images, you get quite an interesting look out of this thing. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. So, what are, if it sounds like an, an amazing sensor, but like you said, given the right situation and the the right variables being in place, it can do wonders. 
does that, I mean, what are the limitations or what are the weaknesses? Does that mean that, okay, I can only take this thing out if it's at, you know, twilight and not too much sunlight because I won't be able to see the LCD, uh, you know, or got to stand on one foot in order to get that image. You know, what, what are the weaknesses and what are the trade-offs of using something like this? Yeah, I, I mean, technically, you know, the camera doesn't do well at high ISOs. Raw files, you can get up to the max of about 1,600. The JPEGs, for some reason, look pretty bad if you shoot JPEGs straight out of the camera if you get above ISO 400. Ooh. Um, so, you know, shoot raw with this camera. And again, if if you're going to use a camera like this, you should shoot raw yeah. because you can take advantage of what it is. The dynamic range and the saturation really fall off once you crank up the ISO. Um, so you really want to, for best quality, you want to shoot this at ISO 100 or 200 anyway. Okay. Um, the, you know, the shutter speed is a maximum of a two thousandth of a second. So if you want to shoot wide open, which does look pretty good, um, you're going to have trouble in bright daylight because you'll just have too much light and there's no ND filter. Um, but the, the, the thing about this camera and I wish, you know, I've only had it for a week. I have got to go back today. I wish I had more time to play with it because what I found is that if I take a fairly casual shot with this, the image looks worse than an other camera. Mm -hmm. Uh, things tend to look flat and uninteresting, but if I take a picture where the light is really good, and I have interesting texture, and I have depth in my image. And by depth, I don't mean foreground, background. I mean objects that are three-dimensional, um, that have you know depth in the object within the object itself. Okay. Sure. Yeah. I can get some remarkable images. Um, I did some great stuff on a tripod. Tripods really help with this camera. I I can't explain it. All I can say is that you can get some phenomenally good in images out of this that you can't get with most other cameras. And we'll put we'll put a gallery on the yeah. on the the blog post for this on on thisweekinphoto.com slash gear that people can check out. Absolutely. Now, now when you look at this the technology in this, when I see it, I'm thinking, well, you know, the form factor is kind of quirky here, but the way that you describe this sensor, I would love to have this technology in a mainstream camera. You know, like a Nikon or Canon or Sony or Panasonic or Olympus, one of those guys. Do you think that's where this might be going? That you know, that like Sony is is creating the chips for Nikon, could we see Sigma creating the chips for, say, you know, a Panasonic in the future? Yeah, I I doubt it. Um, so many things would have to happen for that to occur. One is obviously the business relationships that exist between Sony and Nikon, for example, mm -hmm. uh, would have to be disrupted. Yeah. Also, you know, the, these, these cameras produce a raw file that's unlike any other raw file. For example, a very important thing here is you cannot import these into Lightroom. Lightroom uh -oh. doesn't know these. And, and I have a feeling that these raw files are so unusual that they cannot be converted to Adobe's DNG format. Interesting. That that is uh, definitely point of <laughs> definitely a point of consideration. There, you can't import these into Lightroom. That's right. And I or, and I and or Photoshop Camera Raw, presumably, because they use the same raw processing engine. Right? Exactly right. Now they they ship. Uh, you have to download it, but there's an app called Sigma Photo Pro, uh, which you use to process the raw files. It's like. Uh, Adobe Camera Raw version 0 0.1. It is, okay. I mean, actually, it's been updated, but this thing is slow. It takes almost a minute to render one raw file into uh, a TIFF or a JPEG. Oh, um, um, so okay. this is why you don't go out and shoot, you know, a few hundred images with this camera because it's going to take you a while to see them properly. You got to treat um, this like a medium format camera, and I'm starting to understand your comment about this being a cult camera. Yeah, exactly. You got to walk over some hot coals in order to get to your images. <laughs> yeah, I said you have to want to love this camera, yeah. and and then you get sucked in because of the quality. I can see people doing that, but you know, you ha you have sliders for highlights and shadows and exposure and contrast, sort of the typical kinds of things you'd expect. You have to learn your way around it, but it's a very uh, primitive. Um, raw processing application uh, that can then generate an 8 or 16-bit TIFF or a JPEG file coming out of that. I wish what it did was generate a DNG that had a wide dynamic range or even a 32-bit HDR file, but it doesn't do that. You're stuck with uh, these medium definition or low, or, or, sorry, medium or low high dynamic 
medium or low dynamic range files like TIFF and JPEG. Yeah, yeah. Even a 32-bit TIFF would be nice, but it doesn't do that. But so, they, could. they could in the future if they wanted to, right? They, they could. They could because the data is there. When you look at these and you take that exposure slider down or up and you see what you might recover from the shadows and recover from the highlights, there's a lot of data in there. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but uh, you know, you can't then keep all that dynamic range unless you really reduce the contrast so that you can take it into Lightroom. So, again, you learn to live with this strange application. The other, other possibility is just to shoot JPEG, and then, of course, you can read them into Lightroom directly. Right. But you're just not taking advantage of what this camera can do. Right, right. So what about, uh, we talked a little bit about the, the ergonomics of this thing. You touched on the LCD um, a little bit in terms of it being a little bit dark in or not or unreadable, I think you said, in bright sunlight. Yeah. Anything here's, else here's on this. that? So there's no EVF, obviously, but anything, any other things you want to touch on with that uh, LCD? Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's bare bones, right? You've got uh, no touch, right? For the people who are going to complain, we always complain about touch, <laughs> not even close to this. as. Yeah. As I think you commented to me once, what do you expect, Doug? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, uh, it doesn't articulate. You know, it's just the screen on the back of the camera. That's all you've got. Yeah. Um, I mean, you say there's no touch, but according to you, there's there's no touch, and in bright sunlight, there's no look either, right? That's right. <laughs> yeah, no touch, no see. <laughs> um, so that's that's obviously a, a problem with the thing. Yeah. Um, the um, one thing that, just while we're talking about viewfinders and so forth, the exposure metering was better than most cameras. I was very impressed by just putting it in sort of matrix, you know, whole image exposure metering. It did a very good job of setting the exposure, so I was impressed with that. Autofocus, just contrast-based autofocus, it works quite well. Again, it's appropriate for the camera, let's put it that way. Yeah. It's not a sports camera, it's not an action camera, so that we're not judging it on that basis, but... Uh, it has face detection, which works, and uh, it does a good job at autofocus. So it can it can focus on a landscape like that, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but don't take it to a, don't take it to your kid's baseball game or yeah, anything. Yeah, it's not but, what you want. Okay, and it's got face detection in there. You said too. Right? Yep. Excellent. What about manual focus? How does that work? Manual focus is also pretty good. Um, it's got uh, it doesn't have the mode I thought it did from the menus, but I can't get it to work. So you can't like just turn the focus ring and have it zoom in automatically while you fine tune the focus. Yeah. But by just pressing a button on the back, you can zoom into two levels and get it to do a really nice job. No focus oh, peaking. That's cool. Yeah. No focus oh, no peaking. Focus peaking yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it, it's pretty good. Again, if you can see the viewfinder. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't want to manually focus this outside. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and yeah. Again, what do you expect, Doug? Right. <laughs> so, so, okay, would I, I feel like I'm answering my own question here. <laughs> audio you know and video, called. right? No audio, no video, right? Yeah, yeah. This part of the this part of the review gets really short. There's no video. Yeah. There's no headphone jack. There's no mic jack, right? Nothing. Yeah. And, and what about next, connectivity? Yeah, let's connect, connect to this. You know, Wi-Fi. NFC, GPS, forget it. Not, none of that kind of stuff in it. No, no, no. Uh, but it has I, a plug in there. You can plug it in and get your images off or something. Does yeah. it? Or does it? Does, it? it does. Yeah, no, no, it does. It has, here, I'll show you the one thing it has over here. Uh, over here on the left side, I can open it. The left side is where you've got your USB connector. Okay. Which you can see there. Yep. And your SD card. Your SD card goes in that's there it. as well. Simplicity. Elegant Simplicity. Yeah, it's bare bones, you know. That's bare what you bones. expect, right? You say bare bones, I say elegant simplicity. Come on. There you go. Well, I mean, they did, you know, again, it is it is sort of a nice, elegant, simple camera. Yeah. Um, and, you know, let's face it, it's only $1,000, and we're going to look at this compared to cameras that cost more. So it's a lot of quality for $1,000, but yeah. it's okay. not maybe a lot of camera in terms of ergonomics for $1,000. Okay. Well, let's wrap. Let's wrap this up. So, who is this in the ring against? Who's the competition for this? Oh guy? boy, these, these some of these get really hard. Um, yeah. There are two ways to look at this. One way is okay. I have a camera that is a fixed focal length camera. Uh, who else has one of those that I would compare it to? Mm -hmm. So, one comparison is to the Fujifilm X one hundred S, which costs three hundred dollars more. Mm -hmm. Now. That is a great camera. It's one of our favorite here on All About the Gear. Um, marvelous images, same size sensor, um, 
this camera under the right conditions has an even better image quality than the Fuji, but the Fuji is one of the most user-friendly cameras in the world, oh, yeah. and this is one of the least. And it's got a viewfinder, and it shoots video, yeah. and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. yeah, all sorts of stuff. So then the other possibility is to go to the, um, you know, go all the way up to the Sony RX1R, which is also a fixed lens, fixed focal length camera, but mm -hmm. that's $2,800. Great image quality. It's yeah. certainly... The thing about the RX1R is it'll give you great image quality in a wide variety of circumstances as opposed yeah. to the Quattro, uh, which is going to do so only on some specific situations that even I can't figure out. But that <laughs> camera is also $2,800, so it's almost it three funny. times the cost. Which is really interesting. Yeah, here's one. I was holding it up. Here's one now. This is RX1. Yeah, uh, that's the original. It's the original, and yeah, but still really, really great, expensive. great camera. Yeah, full uh, frame. But these are the, the Sony RX1, the RX1R, are is full frame, right? Yeah, it is so full frame. They're, they're adding on a thousand dollars for that, right? right. But I got to tell you, this camera, even though it's APS-C, again, if your ISOs are low, you don't see any disadvantage of the slightly smaller sensor. This is quality that's up there with any full frame camera when it's done right. So, this is this is unusual in that sense. Huh. So then you got you do have the rest of the Sony full frame cameras like the A7R, the A7S. They both cost at least twice as much money. And then you've got the the new Nikon D810, which is a 36 megapixel camera, and this camera can compete with that on image quality. Uh, maybe not on dynamic range, but in terms of detail and color. I didn't mention color in particular, but the colors are gorgeous out of this camera. They're just really? remarkable. So, huh. uh, but the A10 is a $3,300 camera. So yeah, it's 30, uh, and then you get the fast shutter speed. You can shoot sports. You can do birding. You got yeah. interchangeable lenses. It goes on and on and on. Yeah, you yeah. get a lot more camera out of all of these than you get out of this camera. Huh. So, Okay. Weird. All right. Well, bottom line, Doug, you know where I'm going with this. Bottom line, who is this camera for? Uh, well, first of all, it's for people who already have decided they really want this camera, and there are a number of them out there. Mm -hmm. I tried to figure out, you know, who would use this and what you would use it for, and there's an, a test I'd really like to run. I was in a museum locally uh, a few weeks ago, and I used a small camera to shoot photographs of paintings. Um, just because I was going to use them for teaching purposes, the, the composition and so forth. Um, but you get home and you realize they're very disappointing images. This is a camera I would love to take into the museum and shoot some of those paintings. I have a feeling it would do a beautiful job of reproducing paintings. I think, again, things that where you have to reproduce color, even very vibrant color, mm -hmm. where you have to, to reproduce detail, uh, and and depth and dimensionality, I think this camera would do really well. What that means in terms of who should actually buy that, uh, all I can say is it's people who have some specific requirements like that. And yeah. I don't know who that is. I don't know if it's product photography, uh, if it's industrial photography. Uh, it's really hard to say. But this is a camera that in a little while you're going to be able to rent these things. Mm -hmm. And I think that anybody who's curious should go out and rent run or take advantage of Sigma's Try Before You Buy program. Uh, we'll put a link to that in the show notes too so that people can go and find out how they might be able to get a hold of one of these for a week to give it a try. Cool. Well, excellent thorough review as usual. I'm looking forward to seeing your final uh, numerical review on all about the gear on the on the website <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know it's a strange system that we have now because uh we have star ratings and uh the problem is that ra bad rating in one criterion can pull down the whole thing so hey that's you know, life man that's it life. is it is you can have a camera that's got the most amazing image quality but if the if you can't see the viewfinder what good is it right exactly exactly LCD. So what's coming up next? What's next on your list of... Yeah, we got, some, we got some more interesting stuff. First of all, we've got the new Lytro Illum coming in. Illum, mm. Illum whatever it's called. Illum. That's really going to be an interesting camera to play with. And um, it does seem like we're doing a couple of oddballs, but that's what's around right now. But yeah. as we've said, we're about to hit new camera season between Photo Plus Expo, Photo Kina. There's a lot of new stuff, stuff coming out, and we hope to get our hands on it as soon as possible. Yeah, yeah, I can't wait. This is fun. These are these are fun shows to do because I can I can geek out vicariously through you without adding to my photo gear library over here. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, I mean, good for me. The, the the good news is I think I have enough cameras at least for the next month that I don't have to buy anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 
Yeah. <laughs> I'm waiting for the day until you get like, you know what? I'm tired of looking at these cameras. I just want to go shoot. I'm tired of all these sensors. Let it be done. <laughs> well, un- un- unfortunately, things like this camera are really intriguing and I do enjoy yeah. testing. them. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Doug, thanks a lot. And this is, uh, I think this is another episode of All About the Gear. It's in the camera. All right. Thanks, Roger. See you next time. All right. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.